Here's the part where we welcome you all back to now the fourth of eight sessions for the 2024 Grant Wood Country Forum, Art, History, Culture, and Community Converging Around All Things Grant Wood. And um, we're so happy tonight to have as our featured presentation, uh, Dorothy Bunning Montgomery, all the way from a sunny California, um, uh, doing Art Unveiled, the vibrant palette of the artists at Stone City Art Colony. And so she's a an author and a professional speaker, and of course, a, a daughter of Grant Wood Country. And so we'll appreciate what she is going to reveal to us uh, that will enhance everything we've already learned this year and in years past. So I expect some fun questions and conversations. And um, I want to be sure to let everybody know that we always thank our host, the Cedar Rapids Public Library. Uh, we appreciate them uh, hosting us and doing this and, and um, sponsoring our uh, annual, biannual now, Grant Wood Country Chronicle publication that allows folks to um, witness kind of the unique voice and convergence of conversation that we have here. So appreciate that. And coming up next is we're going to, I'm going to put the ask out to see if anybody has written a poem this week that they'd like to share, because that's the thing we do. And if not, that's okay. Um, I'll uh, email you some things and some suggestions um, again, in case that gets you going. So Anybody have a poem? Maybe not this week. Oh, Jane's got one. Yay. I, I had a feeling somebody would have one. So we'll do, so in just a second, we'll, we'll do your poem, Jane. And I want to be sure to announce to everybody that I did get word that the last two sessions are now uploaded onto the Cedar Rapids Public Library's YouTube channel. So I think we're all caught up at this point. So that's delightful. So without further ado, would I would love to hear, we would love to hear what you have, Jane. I think it was Audrey who raised her hand. Oh, Audrey, excuse me. Yeah, sorry about that, Jane. Oh, okay, so I unmuted myself, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. All right. This um, this is not final, but it's just kind of what I was scratching on this week. The mysterious Mrs. Woods ran from her ex to see what was next. Chicago and New York theater scene. Her parents didn't know what her outfits mean, but she found Grant. She introduced him around dressed him better than a clown. They made a home for mom and Nan She decor in Iowa City. She decorated it quite pretty. One day from the hospital, she came homebound. There was no one to be found. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> it ripped from the true... <laughs> ripped from the headlines of Steve's uh, presentation two weeks ago. That's great. Yeah. Anyway, and I'm Thank sorry you. I've missed a couple of them because I'm, I'm, I'm still off with my my um, accident, my head, you know, my injury in my head with my concussion. So I was like, oh man, I keep missing these. So now I'm on track, I think, but I didn't have the link again today. So I was like, oh man. So anyway, well, that's I'm, all right. I'm you figured, you fig we made it happen. So, and you, <laughs> and you made a poem happen. So I love that. So thank okay, you good. so much. And um, so next we would have a uh, factoid or factoids from Paul. Well, I came Paul up Google. with an, an interesting one uh, for this week. I think I had often read uh, where Merville, that was Grant's father, uh, that uh, his mother, Merville's mother, had given birth to seven children. And I'd also read that a couple of them died in infancy, or um, I don't know how old they were, but, but uh, uh, they died very young. 
And I also knew that there were four, three siblings to Merval, and Merval was the oldest one. And I thought the Wood family was kind of strange in some ways. Uh, some of you have read before about after the wedding, um, he didn't have the bride come to his home for some reception uh, celebrations, and that the family, the Wood family, really thought the Merville shouldn't have gotten married. He was the oldest son, and he was responsible for the grandparents and, and his younger siblings. And some of them were born back in Virginia and then came to Iowa. But what was really interesting about all of this is I found a family tree that Nan had written. It's in her scrapbook, but I'd never looked at it really carefully to see what it entailed. But I found that there was an older boy, older than Merville, named Charles. And after his name in the family tree, it says, uh, ran, ran away from home, no record. So Merville would have had an older brother. And then later I found in pencil something that said after uh, that same ran away from home, something that said to Texas. So possibly there was a Wood uh, descendant that went to Texas, may have had family. Uh, um, Merville uh, Grant could have had some cousins, Wood cousins down in uh, Texas. I just thought it was real fascinating. Now, again, in research, you never know for sure what all is real and what all is not. But if you go to her scrapbooks and look at the family tree of both the Woods and the Weavers, that's an interesting thing to look for. The other factoid I'm going to share with you today is that uh, both Nan and Grant, brother and sister, uh, went to high school and graduated in the Cedar Rapids area. But they didn't go to the same high schools. Um, Grant graduated from Washington High School, which is, of course, the site of the Cedar Rapids Public Library. But Nan went to Kenwood High School. That little area between Marion and, and Cedar Rapids had a high school at that time. And I also read that there were only two graduates at, at that time. Nan was one of two, and they were both, both women. And the final factoid I have tonight is that during the 1950s, one of Grant Wood's paintings was made into curtains, drapes. Now we had, in growing up, we had some of those drapes, but it wasn't by Grant Wood. Ours were by Grandma Moses um, in the 50s. But Grant Wood also had drapes made. And do you know which uh, of his paintings they showed? Uh, the paintings uh, showed uh, the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere. Wow. So a few factoids <laughs> for you. I would have guessed fall plowing. Pardon? I would have guessed fall plowing. Yeah. I would have <laughs> preferred it. I can't, it's hard to imagine drapes in a living room with Midnight Ride of Paul <laughs> Revere. But... That, that, that seems very quirky. <laughs> yeah, it is. Paul, that, oh, that's what I had tonight. I'll add to your factoids, Paul. So yes. Yeah. In Nan's scrapbook, there's a swatch of that of that um, fabric for Midnight Ride. Oh, yeah. And also the family genealogy, was that the one that's on blue, blue paper? White paper. It, I think it's white paper at the very end of one of the scrapbooks. Because I have, so there was a huge... A family tree that Frank had at his home, and it was almost on um, what do they call that uh, architect type paper rolled out, and um, it's blue and with white writing. And I have that on my page. Um, I actually still own, own the um, the family tree that he had rolled up. Mine was not as in good a shape as what Nan had in her in her scrapbook, but if it's the same one. Yeah, why I don't you check that? Why don't you check Debbie and see if uh, Frank had recorded a, a uh, uncle named Charles? Okay, I will look at it. Yep. All right. Well, we're we're really off to off to the races already. That's great. Uh, and did you get? And thank you, Paul. Did you have any, any more questions? You have your hand up, Debbie. Was that it? 
No, you're good. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Paul. Those were those were in fact uh, fascinating factoids. And now it's time for the news with Joe Coffee. All right. Hey, before I launch into it, just a quick note, if you're on the Zoom meeting and um, you might have your settings fixed to like gallery view, I do have some visuals again. So if under view, you click to speaker or if in the upper right hand corner where there are three dots, you can pin and then uh, that'll blow it up. Yeah, one of those two methods and then you can unpin later. But anyway, just want to make sure you can see these visuals as they come up. So in Grant Wood news this week, a riff on American Gothic is featured in the artwork of a new beer released by Vine Street Brewing in Kansas City. The beer was tapped for the first time a few days ago. Hood Saison is an American farmhouse ale described as vibrant, bold, and full of life. Now, farmhouse, farmhouse ale is a category of beer styles that tends to be saison or wet hayish, as they say in beer appreciation circles. The newer American farmhouse style features that Belgian-style farmhouse yeast blend with American ingredients. So you can see the relevance of interpolating American Gothic into the Hood Saison American farmhouse branding. The brewery says, Hood Saison is the narrative of our streets, our struggles, and our victories. It's brewed right here on the block, and it's packed with layers that will intrigue and delight you. Just like a Grant Wood painting. The creative director behind the beer's branding, Art, says the artwork is obviously a spin on the classic painting American Gothic by Grant Wood, but we also baked in nods to local legend Thomas Hart Benton, the Kansas City Kings, which is a basketball team, and the origins of Saison style beer, all done with a Vine Street twist. If you're curious, Many craft beers have riffed on American Gothic over the years, often through associations with the uh, farmhouse style. I find it interesting that um, in Russia, there's a craft brewery, and uh, they had to come up with a name for an American pale ale, so they called it Grant Wood. Oh. It's as if they said, what's something really American that is a fitting name for this, as you may know, um, American beer isn't really known and appreciated outside of America. They do it better everywhere else. But if you have to name an American beer something, if you're in Russia, what better name than Grant Wood, right? Um, all right, moving on. Um, in horse racing, that's right. In horse racing, Grant Wood won his first race last week. The five-year-old Irish gelding took first with 20 to 1 odds at Southwell, Nottinghamshire in England. Grant Wood has had 11 starts and has placed three times now with one win. Okay, back to art. The uh, Muscatine Art Center um, is excited about um, some, frequent, some recent uh, new acquisitions connected to Grant Wood. Some spectacular regionalist works are on display through March 10th. And uh, here's a look at some of them. I thought we could have some fun here. I will say the name of the artist and feel free to turn on your mics and guess uh, which of these paintings they painted. So uh, let's start with this artist, John Stuart Curry. Any thoughts on which one of these was painted by John Stuart Curry? Anyone? I'd guess the ones with the vines, just guessing. As it turns out, his painting uh, that is now at the Muscatine Art Center, it's called the Curry Family Farm. It's believed it was painted in 1930. It's at the top center. All right, here's another one. Marvin Cohn. Any guesses? Bottom left. The Cohn is the upper left. It's called the farm. It's believed it was painted in 1925. These are kind of hard to see. Let me see if I can make them bigger. There we go. But our chances are getting better now. <laughs> <laughs> Something tells me Paul's going to get this. One. All right. Uh, Carl Flick. Yeah. Upper right. Yep. That is called Amana Hotel. Uh, and then uh, William Bunn. I'll give you a hint. His oh, lower right. Five. Lower right. His is a uh, lower, lower left. A lower is left. Is it lower left? Five, oh. 
High Bridge at Muscatine, 1937. And then finally in the uh, bottom right, Barbara Fettler, Effigy Mounds, May. That was actually done in 2018. Um, Fettler, uh, I think, ran the art department at Wartburg. Um, she's Iowa influenced. Um, but I think the rest obviously had connections to Grant Wood. And Dorothy, am I correct? Was William Bunn uh, a member of the colony? I don't think he was, but he was part of Grant Wood's inner circle. And he, I believe he did a lot of the Mississippi Riverboat types of paintings. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but I believe he ended up out at Ojai, California. Oh, okay. Very cool. All right. And our last bit tonight, Grant Wood's Young Corn is to appear on the cover of a new edition of Ruth Sukow's first novel, Country People. By the way, am I saying that right? Is it Sukov? Sukow? Do you guys know anybody? I always heard Suko, but I don't know <laughs> for sure because I just... I was going to ask the same question tonight. That's so funny you asked it because it's in my presentation. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm, I'm like Barbara. I always heard like Suko, but but we'll go, it we'll might go have with been Suko. in my head that I was hearing it because that's the way I said it. You know, I'm not sure which one's right. Well, uh, we'll go with Suko because uh, I, I I trust you guys. Um, this was uh, Suko's first novel. It was published exactly 100 years ago. It is said that Wood and Suko became friends in the 1930s. Um, Suko was a prolific writer who focused on Iowa life. Country People is known for its nuanced portrait of Iowans and how they lived. The release of this new edition uh, is being celebrated February 1st at the Ragged Edge Art Bar and Gallery in Cedar Falls. And there you have it. That's Grant Wood News for this week. Very good. That was fun. So, so Joe, going back to the Ruth Suko and knowing Grant Wood, her husband, who is a writer, sister attended the colony. Okay. Very You'll hear more about that tonight. Ooh, <laughs> so, so you couldn't have done a better radio job tonight or better news job. <laughs> Thank you. The, those were always so unanticipated and quirky and fun. I mean, Thanks. it's just the long arm of Woodland of Woodville, I guess, around the globe. <laughs> Anybody else have anything to piggyback on Joe's news before I going once, going twice? Thank you. Thank you. And I am going to um uh, pause. All right, we're ready. And welcome Dorothy Bunting Montgomery, Art Unveiled, the vibrant palette of the artists at Stone City Art Colony. So good to have you doing this uh, with us and for us. So can't wait. Thank you. And once again, I invite everyone to stop me, ask questions, share. And like I said, there's a lot of information about an area that's near and dear to all of our hearts. But I'm starting off tonight's presentation with Green's Mansion in Stone City, which was the location of the Stone City Art Colony. And I love this photo of this place because it represents so many things for those of us from Eastern Iowa. Not only was it the location of the Stone City Art Colony, but it was also the very first, you could say, large mansion in Stone City, kind of depicting the grandiose of the quarry days. But also it was the summer writing haven for Iowa poet Paul Engel. So a lot of wonderful people and communities and talent that came to this location. And that's why I wanted to start here. Um, as many of you know, this was called Green Mansion, and it was named after the gentleman who actually constructed this, John A. Green, who came from Ireland, came into Iowa, worked at the Dearborn Quarry, and then raised enough capital in order to buy three quarries of his own and, of course, built his house from that same stone. Now, as we look at this house, imagine the the art colony students coming into this home. On the first floor were business offices, meeting rooms, a kitchen. On the second and third floors were dormitories for the female attendees. In the basement is where they had some of their classrooms. Um, also, their 
lithography equipment was downstairs in the basement as well as showers that Grant Wood actually installed himself. Very resourceful. But I love this depiction of this because I remember as a child, the mansion was burned down by the time I could even remember much of this at all. And it actually burned down on Veterans Day 1963. And all that was left was really the remnants of the very first floor and some of the fireplaces. And Elaine and I actually grew up with a boy in our class that lived right below this mansion. I mean, right below on the hill. And he would come into our third grade class and he would do show and tell and he would talk about playing on these ruins. And he'd always talk about this mansion. And honestly, to me, being in, I was nine years old, thinking of mansions, wasn't that something that was in the Southern US? Wasn't that something maybe in more grandiose places like New York or California? But no, there are actually mansions in Jones County as Linda Peterson knows tonight, also in Lynn County. So that was just an aura that I never forgot and always became very curious about all of this. So I also wanted to start off tonight with the painting Stone City, which is actually behind me as well. Um, but once again, to me, this is home. This print was in many of our houses in Jones County, Lynn County. This was the first thing I would see when I leave for school in the morning. It was the first thing I see coming home from school at night. We had this print in our dining room. This is also a depiction of my school bus route. This is the route we would take. Um, the buses would pick up a lot of us kids from the Viola, Stone City areas, and truck us into Anamosa, where the main school districts were. But at one point, I used to know who lived in these houses. I used to know what houses were missing from this painting. I mean, it's so awesome to have a painting like this that now sits in my home, um, the print does, and just to know that I have a remnant of where I grew up and the people I know and just the land and the um, vibrancy that I remember so much as a child. And if you ever have a chance to see this painting at the Joslin Museum in Omaha, I highly recommend it. It is absolutely breathtaking, gorgeous, stunning. The corn actually in the lower part of this painting is actually shimmers in the actual painting. Um, Grant even had the trees that are toward the White House, toward that beige colored house just in the kind of the foreground there, those shimmer as well. And then off to the right, you see at the bend of the road, a billboard. And it's actually a cigarette commercial. And it says, it satisfies. And Grant did that, I know, just to really stay. This is the ideal landscape for me. This is an idyllic place. And actually growing up in this area, when we would look at this print, Honestly, a lot of locals would tell you, if they're really honest, we weren't too impressed with this painting. We thought the roundness of the trees, kind of the little dots in the fields and up on top of the quarry there, and anybody could draw or paint. Well, little did we know what that takes to actually create a masterpiece like this. But that was kind of the vibe from a lot of the locals. It's kind of like, there's this regional guy, his name is Wood, and he paints and he does okay. But we never thought a lot about him, honestly until I think we all grew up, grew away. Um, I know it took me to go into the Metropolitan Art Museum and other museums to really see his works and to say, wow, that guy from home, he actually did pretty well, <laughs> and he did. But I start with this painting because once again, this was the reason they picked the location of the art colony. In 1930, Grant had painted American Gothic, he had painted Stone City, he was getting a lot of acclaim and prominence from this. It was actually his business manager, Grace Boston, for the arts colony that said, that's the reason we picked this location. This was a beautiful location. It's getting a lot of attention, a lot of praise. And, you know, why not step into a beautiful painting and have an art colony? So tonight, what I'm going to focus on, I'm not going to give a lot of history about how the art colony was run. As much as I'm gonna talk about its people, that's what's really been fascinating for me is at this one incredible time in life, this incredible talent came together for two summers in the middle of cornfields during the depression in rural Iowa. And this is where great American art began. And I remember telling that to a writing teacher, a writing instructor, an instructor she said, that's an incredible story because who would imagine art really finding its own in the rural areas of Iowa? 
So tonight I'm going to talk about the faculty. I'm going to talk about some of the notable students. So it's a lot of information, but hopefully it's information that if there's some tidbits, maybe that you don't know, maybe there's some things you do know, feel free to jump in on this. But this is the notable faculty back in the summers of 1932, 1933. I'm sure at the time they were gaining popularity, but it's probably hindsight tells us, wow, this was a, a lineup of talent. The first three names there were really instrumental um, behind the scenes, creating the idea around the art colony. The rest of these um, instructors, a lot of them came from the Art Institute of Chicago. They were local professors in Iowa colleges, universities, and they all did this for free. They did it out of the love of art and the love of inspiring others. So I can't help but start with Grant. And many people say Grant wore overalls because after being over in Europe and you know studying over there, painting over there, that to come home and put on overalls was a way to try to fit back in. But honestly, I think overalls were just practical, right? If you're a painter, you've got a lot of pockets, deep pockets, pockets with snaps, pockets to put paint brushes in, um, sometimes your rags, sometimes your tubes of paints. I think you wore overalls because it also covered up clothes and you didn't get stains on them. And actually, I think it was just very practical. But once again, this was a, um, one photo of the faculty. They're missing a couple of faculty members, which we'll talk about tonight. But um, this was taken out in front of Green's Mansion and, of course, around the stone fruit basket, which I also love. And before we jump in a little bit to the faculty, I want to give you another view of Green Mansion. This is looking northward. You see the ice wagons. This is one of my favorite stories about the art colony, that they had quite a few students sign up, more than they anticipated. In fact, they had 92 that first summer, and they knew where to house the women. They weren't quite sure how to house all the men. And it was Grace Boston, their business manager, who looked at that tent and said, that would be tough to you know, live in throughout a summer because it'd be wet in the morning from the dew from the grass. It just wasn't very practical. She heard about a local man by the name of Joseph. Let me double check his name, um, Chatama. And he was actually ran the Hubbard Ice Company in Cedar Rapids. In fact, he lived just kind of through the backyard and over to the next block from Grant. They knew about the ice wagons and it was Grace Boston who went and talked to Joseph and said, could you give us those ice wagons for an art colony? Of course, he kind of sounded like, ah, he wanted a little something for them. But she said, you know, artists, we don't have money. You gotta help us out here. And so she said, what if we gave you or your family a scholarship to the art colony? And Joseph's like, there's nobody in my family that would want a scholarship. So actually, Grace Boston was very resourceful and said, well, what if we gave it to a, a local student who can't afford to go, but would love to go? What do you think about that? Joseph nodded his head and said, it's a deal. And they sent Julia Sampson, um, who was a local Cedar Rapids art student in high school, who had written a letter to Grace um, saying, I want to go so bad. And so she won that scholarship. But the ice wagons had that vibe, that feel of bohemia that they really wanted at the art colony. In fact, they took all of these ice wagons down 151 at 4 a.m. in the morning, trying to get them to Stone City, kind of behind a truck of some kind. And I would have loved to see all those ice wagons coming towards Stone City. But once again, they made it an art project. Um, throw your bed in the back, paint your own wagon, so to speak. And a lot of the male um, participants, students, either lived right there on the grounds or they took the ice wagon down to the river and lived along the river. Now, I love this photo because I think about everybody painting their ice wagons and probably who had the best looking mural or painting, it had to be Grant. This is actually Estes Park, Colorado. He had been there a couple of times. Um, I don't think this is in, in existence to this day. I wish it was. Um, I know um, I'm thinking of my sister right now, Linda Peterson. You have a friend called Sandy Smith who said a lot of these ice wagons, I think, eventually became chicken coops. <laughs> they were used on farms, and I hate to think that this could have become a chicken coop, but who knows. But um, Grant set that stage once again to make this a great place to come and learn and paint. And of course, one of the most notable people that came to Stone City was John Stewart Curry, 
the regionalist of Kansas. And of course, the other regionalist from Missouri was Thomas Hart Benton. The three men knew each other. And the fact that I love the term regionalist, they really broke the glass ceiling to say great art can come from America and it can come from great American artists. At that time, America felt like a lot of the great artists came from overseas, that no one could really paint that well here. And that's what they were out to prove, that if you paint what you love, you paint those things around you, I feel that their greatness really came out. Well, John Stuart Curry came to Stone City the summer of 33 for really two reasons. He'd seen the painting Stone City, and he was kind of saying, hmm, that doesn't look like Iowa. That's, that's too good. It can't look like, I have never seen Iowa look like that. And he knew it looked idyllic as well. And he also knew that Grant Wood was loved in Iowa. Now, Curry was also a great artist, but he wasn't loved in Kansas. Even though he too painted things in his own backyard, things that depicted his state, he depicted a lot of things in the state that Kansans wanted to forget about, like tornadoes and the border wars and just anything around some of the religious unrest there in the state of Kansas. They felt he was going to bring down the real estate prices. Well, so he came to Iowa. He saw Eastern Iowa. He saw Stone City. And he's like, to Grant, you nailed that in that painting, Stone City. is it, This is a beautiful area. And in fact, he lived in... Um, Grant's uh, ice wagon for a couple of weeks. He actually helped support and teach, and he was planning to come back the fourth summer in 34, but of course we all know there was not a, a third summer for the art colony due to financial reasons. But this is one of my favorite, favorite paintings in the whole world. It's by John Stuart Curry. It's called The Tragic Prelude, and of course it's about the board wars between Kansas and Missouri. And my sister Diane and I in the audience had a grandfather who used to hang out with a lot of men that were grandfathers at the time. He was a little boy talking about these border wars and stories and of course pass in some of them on to us. So this reminds me a lot of my own grandfather. So the next two people I'm gonna talk about from a faculty perspective is Edward Rowan and Adrian Dornbush. Edward Rowan, I think we could do a whole night on Edward. He was incredible. He was really behind a lot of taking art out to the masses during the depression. He worked a lot with um, the Carnegie Foundation. He was running the little art gallery here in Cedar Rapids. And one of the things I read about the little gallery that he had, I believe it was on First Avenue, not too far from Coke College. It was a three-story house and he was always doing a lot of events. He was behind a lot of just things happening in the art culture in Cedar Rapids. But also he would write for the Cedar Rapids Gazette, often featuring a lot of the artists, a lot of the situations and happenings. And in fact, this is his ice wagon. And they said some of the ice wagons came already with these um, kind of plant holders. It almost looks like he just dolled his up a little bit. Um, it looks like he's got a little bird theater there, but also very creative. But going back to the little gallery, that three-story house, he had some really great events. One of the events I heard that he did was imagine walking into that house and on the first floor, you might walk back into the room and there's Grant Wood sharing some of his artwork, sharing some of his insights on art. Go to the second floor, you enter a room, you might walk into a room where Marvin Cohn is there with his painting instructing the visitor. In another room at the time, was Paul Engel sharing some of his poetry. I just can't imagine what that vibe, what that must have looked like back then to have all these greats really not even understanding yet how great they are um, in this one same area, in this one same community of Cedar Rapids. So these are some of the paintings by Edward Beatty Rowan. Um, he was a watercolorist. I love his color palettes. Uh, Joe Coffey, thanks again for sharing the color palette piece that you did last week. I thought just the palettes alone is just fabulous. And so that inspired me to pick some of these paintings tonight around these artists. But really, Edward um, Rowan, he was a Harvard grad, came to Cedar Rapids, helped get the art colony going. But also he ended up working, um, if I find here, he became what they call Washington, D.C.'s. He was a New Deal's assistant technical um, director of the Public Works of Art Project and, of course, the Federal Emergency Relief Administration. So he was a who's who in art 
um, making sure that America focused on art, especially during the time of the Great Depression when people needed affordable art, they needed some appreciation of American culture. And even though that started to dissipate, he never lost his enthusiasm. He never lost really his just timeless, hard work ethic around creating the love of art for Americans. Now, Adrian Dorn Bush was born in Holland. He studied at the University of Wisconsin, the University of Kansas, and also overseas. He also organized the Flint Michigan Institute of Art and became a guest instructor at the Little Gallery in Cedar Rapids. So you now can see these friendships between Adrian and Ed and Grant forming in the 1928, 1929 to early 1930s. And of course, once he um, was the director at the Stone City Art Colony, he also, um, he moved to Des Moines for a while, but he got involved in what's called the new Key West Florida Federal Emergency Relief Administration, the art department more specifically. And once again, what he was on point to do in Key West is start to bring tourists to Key West. And he did that by bringing artists to Key West to paint their surroundings, get people enticed to see what does Key West look like through, of course, artwork, and brought a lot of tourism to Key West. And I was doing research on Adrian um, you know, one of the things we remember about him, the Stone City Art Colony, is that he had the apartment at the top of the water tower on the colony grounds. If you remember, there was no stairs to that water tower floor. You had to take a ladder. So I can't imagine him going up and down a ladder every day at the art colony just to sleep at night and to begin his day. But um, when he was at Key West, one of the things I found online is actually an interview of him talking about um, his work in Key West and the impact that he made. And that is something that I am actually going to share in chat tonight. It's a link where you can listen to him being interviewed. And the reason I wanna share this with you is let me ask you all of this. How many of us have heard the voices of anybody from the Stone City Art Colony? Um, we've heard Nance, we've heard now we're gonna hear Adrian's. I'll let you take that home tonight and listen to it. I know, um, Debbie, you know Nan's voice, but who other, who else's voice do we all know that have gone to the Stone City Art Colony? I don't think too many. So I'm sharing that with everybody so you can listen to Adrian Dornbush. It's just awesome to be able to hear from somebody who was so instrumental at the Stone City Art Colony. So Marvin Cohn, Barbara Keller did a fantastic job last week talking about Marvin Cohn. And as her and I were talking about both our presentations, she gave you the best information about Marvin Cohn. I'm going in, in a little bit different direction, but I've always been fascinated with the story of these two men, Grant Wood, Marvin Cohn, you know, high school friends um, working together, their love of art, traveling together overseas to learn their craft. And definitely they were lifelong friends. In fact, um, it's been said that neither one was jealous of the other. They were always very supportive of each other, just lifelong friends. And it was also their love of the Art Institute, the love of painting overseas, that Marvin met his wife, Winifred, who was sitting next to him to his left. I'll come back to her. But one of the things first I want to share is that Marvin Cohn was actually in the First World War. He was a private and he actually enlisted in the Iowa National Guard's 34th Infantry Division in 1917. And during that time, he won a training camp design composition um, because of this insignia that is the Red Bull. It's the insignia for the 34th Infantry Division. Well, my father was part of that division. This emblem was on my father's uniforms. His emblem was everywhere around our house because my dad was very proud World War II vet. And lo and behold, I never knew that Marvin Cohn designed this until about maybe five, 10 years ago. So great surprise. And one of the things that Marvin said that he was proud of is watching this infantry march and seeing that Red Bull signia for the 40, 34th. So. That's one of the things I wanted to share about him. Here's a couple of other paintings of Marvin's. And 
we know he did a lot around the clouds. We know he did a lot around the hills of Iowa. I would gather just say this could have been, I'm going to guess this is the Cedar River. Um, that looks more like the theater to me. I know he spent a lot of time around the Cedar River. But also one of the things I'm notating on these slides tonight is if they were Iowa State Fair winners. And thankfully to Paul Jewell's book, Grant Wood and the Iowa State Fair, which I have a copy of right here, he writes about the people that attended the art colony who actually won prizes at the Iowa State Fair. And of course, Marvin Cohn was one of them, as well as Adrian Dornbush. And you're going to see this little signia tonight in my presentation of those winners. That's really incredible. You're going to see how many people were at the Stone City Art Colony and actually won a lot of prizes, not only at the Iowa State Fair, but in other states. Um, once again, showing what they've learned at the Stone City Art Colony. So Winifred or Winnie Cohn, as I talked about her tonight, she was actually from Canada. Sean Grantwood actually knew her. She met Marvin Cohn on a ship. It was the SS Grampian. And in those days, when you met someone and married them, especially if you're from Canada, you automatically became a US citizen, which she did. She gave birth to their one and only daughter, Doris, who had four children. Many of us know two of her children who are great artists. Um, we've seen them in some of these sessions we've done with the Cedar Rapids um, um, Art Museum. But she was really a driving force behind Marvin's career. She was one of those women who she invested in his work, invested in supporting him. And in fact, she was the one who picked out Marvin's paintings when he had to exhibit. He was trying to figure out what should I exhibit? She would pick those out and she would actually ship them. So she was kind of the woman behind the man. She ended up outliving Marvin by about 30 years. She lived into her mid nineties. But once again, just a huge key asset to, I would say, everything Marvin Cohn. Florence Sprague Smith, of course, at the art colony, she was known as Florence, but she was someone who really rounded out the art colony. A lot of these faculty were artists, watercolors. They did lithographs, they did framing, but she brought in the sculpture piece of this work. And in fact, when she, she was highly sought after, she knew a lot of the faculty members already, and she would do a lot of her classes down in the abandoned quarries. And one of the artists I'm going to talk about tonight is Isabel Bloom, a well-known artist from Davenport. And in fact, I got to meet Isabel. She talked about how she would always go down to these quarries, ask somebody to help her lug up a piece of limestone because she would carve from that, li that limestone that makes um, sense that her teacher, mentor, actually took them to the quarry, taught them sculpting. But actually, Florence had done this since she was a little girl. She was from Northwest Iowa, Paulina, ended up moving into Des Moines, where she learned a lot about sculpting. Um, she actually loved to sculpt animals. Um, Paul, I was reading in your book that she followed the Ringling Brothers Circus and uh, loved, the, loved animals from that. And that makes sense that Isabel Bloom also follows suit of her mentor and did a lot of shapes and sculptures around animals as well. So this is something I found in the Cedar Rapids Gazette just right before the opening of the art colony on June 26th. This was an article in the Cedar Rapids Gazette in May of 1932. But they are just once again saying how they are so thrilled to have her because she is someone who is, she's an instructor at Drake University School of Fine Arts. She also was, you know, she did art classes for a lot of the women's groups. Uh, she was also instructor at the Laura Coffey School of Art in Des Moines, just teaching wherever she could and also worked with the Des Moines Playground Commission. And she ended up being somebody who married somebody at the art colony. Tonight we're going to feature actually three couples. That was always a question I had back in the day. Did anybody meet at the art colony, fall in love and get married? Well, Florence was one of those people and who she fell in love with was Jefferson Randolph Smith III. And she's standing right by him in this photo. Now, Jefferson came really the second summer, 1933. He was in the newspaper industry, especially out of the St. Louis area. He was a cub reporter and he worked for a lot of different newspapers and knew a lot of these people here in the Iowa area. 
And one of the things they brought him in for was he had this keen um, sense, business sense, and they knew he would be really good. In fact, the summer of 33, they knew they were losing money at the colony and they really brought him in to help them get back on their feet. Because once again, he was just really good at accounting. He was good at promotional things. He could talk to newspaper people. He could talk to staff. He really, he had an office on the first floor of the Green Mansion and really was kind of that public um, figure that they needed to continue to hone and run the art colony. But him and Florence fell in love. They actually married in 1934. And in fact, when she married him, she gave up all of her academia work. And they settled in St. Louis and ended up living in Los Angeles, where I found they are both buried here. And these are a few pictures of Jefferson Randolph Smith. And he's actually, his father was a notorious gangster in Alaska, in the Denver area. He was called Soapy. And Paul, I was reading in your book that the reason he was called Soapy is he'd often put dollar bills around um, a bar of soap, making it look like a bundle of bills. But his father ended up being murdered or killed in kind of a duel at a very early age. But a lot of the things you see in movies um, depict a lot of Soapy Smith, um, some of his criminal activities across the western part of the United States. But his son, um, by all intents and purposes, lived a very good life with Florence. And once again, they ended up owning their own business in Los Angeles, like I said, where they ended up living and be buried here. So Arnold Pyle, this is Arnold here in this picture. And this is somebody that once again, he was an assistant at the little gallery. So once again, you can see the relationships forming. He was actually a very good framer. That was the class that he taught at the Stone City Art Colony. Um, and of course, we know a very famous painting that Grant did of him where Arnold comes of age. Of course, that was done in 1930. So you can see that Wood is really at the height of his teachings, his experience, his paintings, because in 1930s, American Gothic, 1930s, Stone City, 1930s, Arnold comes of age. And of course, this won um, the top prize at the Iowa State Fair Art Salon, which is the name of the Iowa State Fair's art contest. And Grant entered this, but he also entered Stone City, which won for the best landscape category. But one of the reasons people love this painting is because he, he wrote about Arnold Comes Alive. You can see in the eyes and you can see in the expression, this is the young man whose world and life is still way ahead of him. He's not disillusioned yet. And once again, these paintings were bought by many of the areas, the museums in uh, Nebraska. Of course, we know that Stone City was taken by the Jocelyn Museum or bought by the Jocelyn Art Museum. And then of course, this one was at, let's see, the Nebraska Art Association bought this one. And what I love, one of the things to read about, for example, the Jocelyn Art Museum and buying Stone City so, early in Grant's career, they often said, we saw talent before the rest of the world knew how talented he was. And I love that with the Jocelyn, that they, they knew talent way back and bought that painting as fast as they could. Now, the sad part when I think of Arnold Pyle is he actually died in a car crash in Lynn County, just actually shot the biologist north of the farm I grew up on, um, coming back from one of the very first Grant Wood days in Anamosa. Um, very sad that he was lost. He's actually worked at Collins Radio. He spent a lot of time in that job trying to paint on the side, but still very much invested in the art community and once again invested in his friendships with Grant and the other faculty. Now, Dennis Burlingame, I find him to be very interesting. Um, he travels with the circus as a young man. He took a lot of odd jobs. Um, he soon got tired of that life and wanted something a little bit more steady. And so he left the circus to create murals and stage scenery for high schools. Um, Grant Wood discovered him and invited him to the art colony. He attended as a student the first summer. The second summer, he actually did a framing workshop with Arnold Pyle, helping to assist him. He was a very popular um, faculty member at the time. 
but he was also a self-taught artist. He's taught himself oils. That was kind of his main medium. But he actually worked at the Walt Disney Studios in New York City as an artist. And at one time, he briefly shared an apartment with Jackson Pollock in Greenwich Village. I, too, used to work at the Walt Disney Studios, so I feel kind of a kinship to Dennis Burlingame. But I was in Los Angeles, and of course, he was there much sooner than me in New York. But this is one of his paintings, The Snake Charmer. You can kind of still get that circus feel from him. And of course, this is him doing some of his painting as well. So Grace Boston, you've heard me talk about her tonight. She was that business manager. She was the one that orchestrated the ice wagons. She did a lot of interviews with the newspapers, kind of setting the stage for the art colony and all the happenings that were happening there. You see here, here at the far left. But she also had a very interesting life. She came from Akokoda, not far from Anamosa, uh, but lived most of her life in Cedar Rapids. She lived in the... Um, Detroit, Michigan area for a while makes me wonder if she knew Adrian through some of those means, some of those locations. But she too was someone who was kind of a who's who around town. She was often kind of the head chairman, the head committee person for like the Business Women's Club in Cedar Rapids. Um, she was also part of what's called the Town Hall series in Cedar Rapids, just very integrated in a lot of the things happening there in the city, but also once again, really bringing through the culture and the art focus and prominence. And I actually found this article of her in the Cedar Rapids Gazette around 1926. And she ended up often living with her mother. She inherited her mother's home there on Beaver Avenue. But um, it says she came from Makokoda. She finished high school there. She went to New York where she worked in the offices of the A.N. Palmer Company. Now, I believe the A.N. Palmer Company also had a presence in Cedar Rapids. She was also worked in the advertising department of J.G. Cherry and Company. And of course, for a time, she did research work for the Masonic publication in St. Louis. So once again, a very involved woman. I get a sense she was probably very organized, very good at what she did, but definitely a who's who around the Cedar Rapids area. So two more faculty members I want to share with you. One is Francis Chapin. Um, this is his portrait behind him called Gray River. Um, he was someone, he was actually an instructor at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, he was approached by Grant Wood and accepted a faculty position at the Stone City Art Colony, where he taught lithography for two summers. And his work was also part of the painting event in the art competition at the 1932 Summer Olympics. So spent a lot of his time in the Midwest mainly and ended up dying in Chicago, but one of the key lithographers there at the Stone City Art Colony. And then David McGosh, McCosh, I'll back up there. You see him kind of um, in between his masterpiece. But he ended up, um, too, being in a lot of different art competitions. Um, he was probably the youngest instructor at the Art Colony. He was born in 1903. He graduated from the Arts Institute of Chicago. And he began his teaching career there, but eventually traveled to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he married a painter there. And they both um, ended up moving to Oregon where he taught at the University of Oregon for many, many years until his retirement in 1970. So that rounds out our faculty. And as I talk a little bit about notable artists tonight, I'm going to connect them to the faculty that were their mentors. You can start to kind of see these connections. But I love the artist view from the Green Mansions lawn. This is looking toward the Northeast. This is looking toward St. Joseph Church. Just some different photos of the students. Once again, between the areas of Viola, Anamosa, Stone City, you would often see the students out and about. I have an aunt that talked about she would do um, a milk route with her father going through the streets of Anamosa. They were heading to the art colony in Stone City and they would see artists up and down the streets of Anamosa painting. And in fact, the picture to the right, once again, is up on the hill where Green's Mansion was looking toward the Northeast, toward St. Joseph's Church, toward the Wapsie Pinnacle, which you cannot see, but at the bottom. But on the left is two photos that I adore because they're of Viola, Iowa. In fact, this location in Viola when you come into Viola from the east, you go down a hill, 
you go across the stream, you go across the railroad tracks, and you come to kind of a fork in the road. And if and in these two pictures to the left, if you're to take a right, you'd actually go up to a store. And Elaine, Maddie Lee, lives right there. So this is Elaine's neck of the woods. Elaine, I hope you don't mind me pointing that out. And if you took a left, um, you would go up to a school that was a high school. At one point, Viola became a elementary school for the Animals of School District. And in the upper left there, that house across the street, I remember that from childhood very well. Sometimes it was lived in, sometimes it was boarded up, then it was lived in, then it was boarded up. But the reason we know this is Viola is in the back of these two photos on the left is an octagon shaped house. It's no longer there, but a good friend of ours, of Elaine's and mine, and his family lived there. But that's why we know these are Viola. In fact, Elaine, I think you're related to the lawn, uh, the person who owns that lawn. Isn't that yeah. grandfather's of yours? Uh, yes, yes, on my mother's side. Yep. And what did he have the key to? Uh, I believe, oh, you would ask that. I think, I, I think it was something, it was in the mansion or that complex there. Yeah, he had the green, Around I remember mansion. you telling me, yeah, that he had the key to the mansion. So it makes sense that the artist would come and kind of camp out on his lawn. You know, what they're painting, they're painting a creek. It's actually what they're facing. It's a creek and a railroad track and some woods. Um, the farm I grew up on wasn't too far from this location, but I love that Grant just took the students out to the fields. He took them out to towns and they just painted. He took them into life and he had them draw and paint life. You can also see in the lower left, that's Marvin Cohn there by the easel. I believe that's Adrian Dornbush just to um, our right to Marvin's left there. But I just love that he really took them out to really you know, experienced life and art and did that all around this area of Jones and Lynn's County. So as I talk about- Dorothy? Um, yes. Yeah, before you move on, the picture yeah. in the upper left, um, I think what's not visible across the street from the house is the church that, and that that was the sketches that they were, that he used in one of the paintings that has the church spire that was based on the Viola Church. I love that. Oh. And and the first time I saw that, I think it was one of our cousins that had shown me that picture and told the story about that being the church behind them and it being the model for the spire. I love that. So as I talk about Elaine's family, this is also Linda's family in many respects. Um, and Viola is where a lot of us on the call tonight are from. It's just about two miles straight west of Stone City. Um, like I said, a lot of us grew up in these counties, grew up in these areas, attending the local schools. But um, I would have loved to have seen something like this, seeing all the artists out and about. I'm sure our families was that, where do they have the time to kind of squander away when they should be working? It's a depression, but... Um, I love the idea they still focused on the things that they wanted to craft and carve out of their own lives. I just, I love this whole story. Oh. And I love, oh, go ahead, Elaine. Oh, no, I was going to say, maybe for folks who aren't real familiar with Viola, it's literally only one block. Yes. So, so when, when Linda says the church is behind you, it's, it's like, well, it's because it's the, you know, it's the other side of the block, yes. So it'd be to the north. Right. And <laughs> so pretty so pretty yeah. small place. They would have had to get in cars from Stone City, drive, you know, a little bit to the south, head west. They would have been in Viola in, you know, five minutes. Um, right, right. <laughs> this is something we never knew growing up. You know, we never even had any fathom that there was artists around here. We knew maybe Stone City, but never Viola and uh, or even in Anamosa. So I love my aunt's story about seeing the artists on a summer morning up and down the streets of Anamosa, just painting with their easels. And um, I just think that would be really, really, once again, great to see. So Grant wrote about the aim of the colony and this was a brochure and this is part of it but he said if american art is to be elevated to the stature of a true cultural expression 
It cannot remain a mere reflection of foreign painting. It, in other words, if it's a national expression, it cannot be built on the activity of just a few solitary individuals or be isolated in a few tourist-ridden localities or metropolitan centers. It must take group form from the more genuine and less spectacular regions. Now, I hate to think that Viola and Stone City are less than a spectacular region. I know he meant more than that, but um, I love that really another way of saying it, he's taking this to the masses, he's taking this across the country. And some of the notable students of the Stone City Art Colony, and I'll go through these fairly quickly, but once again, you'll start to see the connections, you'll start to see just some of the greatness that came out of these people. And the first one is Lee Allen. And this is his painting, Foreign Country, from 1937. But Lee Allen um, is born in Muscatine in 1910. His family moved to Des Moines, where he actually studied at the Cumming School of Art. Now, Cumming School of Art in Des Moines, he was actually a professor of art at Cornell and at the University of Iowa. In fact, many years before Grant became that. Um, but when Grant became the Iowa Director of the Public Works of Art Project, Allen was one of his assistants. And in fact, Allen wanted to go and study in Mexico. It was Grant Wood that introduced him to, um, I'm just trying to find the last name, to the artist Diego Rivera. There, I found the last name. And so it was Grant's letter of introduction between Lee Allen and Diego um, Rivera that started a lifelong friendship. And in fact, um, once Lee Allen, you know, studied under the Stone City Art Colony, he studied with Diego Rivera, he eventually came back and he was employed by the College of Medicine at the University of Iowa. Uh, he became a medical illustrator. And in fact, he published a lot of different notable papers on that topic and ended up remaining in Iowa in his later years and passing away in Iowa City. Now, the reason I wanted to talk about the Diego Rivera, um, it wasn't too many years ago here in the state of California that they found one of his murals at the City College in San Francisco, and it was just, this mural was falling apart. And I'm actually very good friends with someone who championed the removal of that mural from the college to save it and gave it to the San Francisco Art Museum. So I love the connections here of just knowing, you know, Grant, just going back to this, Grant knew so many people. It's incredible how he knew so many people and how he never, he never um, hesitated to introduce people, to share his knowledge, to share ways that people could, you know, be great together, study from each other. And of course, Lee Allen too was an Iowa State Fair winner for some of his artwork. And of course, the next two, Isabel Bloom and John Bloom, two of my favorites that I got to meet before they both passed in the Davenport area. But Isabel Bloom was a well-known sculptor out of the Davenport, Iowa area. And she married John Bloom. There's an, our second couple there, who was one of considered one of the last regionalist artists also out of the Davenport area. And they met at the art colony. And the story that they shared with me is that she would actually go down to the quarry Ask some quarry men to help her bring up limestone from the quarry. And she would sit on the front steps of the mansion and she would start to chisel away, do her sculpture. Um, and you can imagine with limestone, that's just so, you know, so easy to fall apart and become a mess. And John got free room and board thanks to Grant Wood, who was his mentor, his protege, and, um, and actually told Isabel, you're making a big mess. And I'm having to clean it up. But that's how they met. That's how they fell in love and ended up working and living in Davenport, where Isabel started her own sculpting company. It's called Isabel Bloom. And of course, both of them won prizes at the Iowa State Fair. And but once again, this was their mentor, Seth John Bloom in the upper right, great regionalist artist. He did a lot of murals and paintings within a lot of post offices of Iowa, especially during um, World War II. And of course, Isabel having her own company or sculpting company. And the reason I actually picked this sculpture of Violet, this was her favorite. And she had, had the idea of Violet probably in the 1950s and 60s, but actually started to produce them more in the 80s. Um, but I have one of these violets just because I remember Isabel saying, this is my favorite one that I did. 
But once again, she made them out of cement. She made them out of Mississippi rock. And once again, put Iowa on the map for great sculpting and of course her husband for great art. And these were their mentors. So I love the connection once again, uh, mentor and the protégés. And in the paint or the photo in 1932 of the students, this is Isabel. You can see the blue arrow to the far right, and that's John. Um, so you can see them back in the day when they met. Another notable painter was Leela Powers Briggs. And this is Leela's um, painting of haystacks and smokestacks from 1949. Um, she was actually from Powersville, Iowa. Um, but it went to school in the Waterloo area. In fact, she graduated from East Waterloo High School. And she too went to the Art Institute of Chicago and the Iowa State Teachers College in at UN, what we now know as UNI. Instead of becoming a teacher, she decided I'm gonna become an artist. And even though she was married and raised her two sons and farmed, she never forgot her painting and she continued to paint throughout her later years. And a lot of her paintings, once again, are captured across the state of Iowa and she won many numerous awards for her work. And she actually passed away pretty early in 1953. And then we have Marilyn Gilmore. She's a muralist. She was born in Ottumwa and her father, too, was a prominent attorney. You hear a lot of these folks had parents who were prominent attorneys, but she wasn't only a muralist, but she was actually a celloist. And she played for a lot of the symphony orchestras in Southeast Iowa area. And she actually um, also attended, though, the University of Kentucky, where she's like, I'm going to study art, which she did. And she moved to New York City and basically did a lot of exhibits around the New York area. Um, once again, studied at the art colony with Grant Wood in the 30s, but overall pretty much ended her days in the New York area, um, but did pass away actually in Ottumwa, so she came home just for a few years. Then Debbie, this is where Debbie said tonight, Dorothy, I think I know part of what you're going to share. And I always like to bring Debbie into this because this photo is from Debbie. Uh, but I love it. You can see it's in her background too tonight on her screen. But I was talking to Debbie and said, Debbie, it says that Nan was an artist. She was an art teacher. What do you know about Nan and her artwork? And Debbie, I'm going to just see if you want to open the, the mic and share anything that you want to on Nan and her artistic abilities. Well, the boarding house bath, that painting Nan displayed in her home in Riverside. I used, I used to get up really close to it and look at it. And if I'm remembering correctly, I think she had it in the bathroom. And somehow it ended up maybe when she was working with Joan uh, Zug, Liffering Zug Bure and her husband on My Brother Grant Wood, I think at some point, I think Nan, um, I don't know if she gave it to her or somehow it ended up with Joan. And then now I believe who owns it is um, uh, the Iowa Historical Society, maybe. But it popped up again on a Facebook post at the American Gothic House, and it might still be there on display. But um, yes, and then the other thing, in some of the things I've read, it said that that was Nan's only oil painting. And I, and I shared with Dorothy, um, so when, when my uncle was, he was widowed at the time. He was living with Nan in Riverside, and he had passed away. I think it was early 80s. And Nan was going to be moving up to Menlo Park. And there were some things that we had gone over to her house, and there were some things she, she asked me if I wanted. And now, of course, I think I was like in my early 20s. I can't remember. I was like, what a dummy. Why didn't I say yes? Well, she had 
a painting of Merval that she had given Frank and it was in Frank's bedroom. And she asked me if I wanted it. And I, I said, no, no, that's okay. So then I didn't think anything of that until a few years ago in her um, archives uh, or the at the the digital archives of her scrapbooks that, and I don't think I knew that Nan had painted it when she asked me if I wanted it, but apparently because Grant had never painted one of their father, she had painted it and given it uh, to Frank as a present for him. And that's in the digital archives. I don't know what happened to it. I don't know if she threw it away or what. So that that's what I knew about her her painting. And then um, there was something in my sister Nan, the little red book uh, done by Penfield Books. Um, I guess she had some expertise in leather work as well. But yeah, she was very artistic. She also made a lot of her clothes. Um, in some of the the photos she has like she liked checker checkerboard or gingham type prints and those were clothes that she would make herself so she was very artistic she was and debbie you said it so well but you know i didn't realize i knew that she was into sewing and i knew that she um was artistic but not in all the ways that you know i've learned about her painting glass being like an assistance, art assistance, a teacher in the Cedar Rapids school systems. I mean, I, she did leather works. Of course, she did the lithographs helping um, Grant, but she did a lot more in this arena than I realized because it seems like we always hear a lot about her more being the, um, you know, keeping the scrapbooks, keeping the information on her brother. But yeah, she was, she was extremely artistic. Her home also in Riverside, it was, I would say, humble elegance because the outside of the home, her, you know, before she moved up to Menlo Park, you wouldn't think of much of it much on the outside, kind of, uh, you know, flat roof and not real big. But when you went inside, it had style. She liked kind of luxurious looking things like with tassels on them and kind of, um, uh, she had like, um, I don't know if it was wallpaper or some kind of mural on the wall, but I always thought going there, it was very luxurious. So the way it looked and how she had it decorated. She was always dressed beautifully. I remember oh. her coming back to the Grant Wood days in Anamosa and she always looked so stylish and my, she was my, beautiful. My sister always commented on her shoes. She loved the shoes nan wore and nan also used to wear hats uh, a lot as well so yeah oh, wonderful thank you debbie okay she debbie helped me a lot with just going through a lot of that tonight so i just wanted you to get credit for all your hard work i appreciate it so conger metcalf barbara this is your area of expertise that you actually talked about last week which was once again really fabulous and I love the story about Conger being one of the youngest um, students at the Art Colony, once again, um, going to Coe College, um, graduating from Coe, and of course, um, going to Boston, where he continued to really become a master painter. And um, is there anything you want to add about Conger or anything from last week? No, I think you're doing a fabulous, fabulous job, Dorothy. Um, uh, he he said, you know, uh, as I mentioned last week, he was he was a little like he wanted to be a musician, and the artist, you know, to me, he must have been so talented to be able to choose which one he's going into. But he knew that he wasn't really as good in music, so he went back to doing art. You know, I just find these people amazing. Thank you for what you're sharing. It was a lot of talent. There was just so much talent. That's why tonight, I know it's a lot of information, but if this is talent that was around Cedar Rapids and Lyndon Jones County. It's just 
just incredible. The next person we're on the home stretch is Marjorie Noon, who was a painter. And she was very notable from the art colony too, just because she was an incredible artist. And Adrian Dornbush was really her mentor. Um, in fact, he tootled her a lot on the watercolors. Um, I had a hard time finding any paintings by her, but she loved to just basically paint abstract art, watercolor. She loved to blend a lot of color, create images, and really found success at home with a lot of what they call small exhibitions. Um, but once again, she did great work whenever she came back home to Iowa to study because she too lived um, in the Chicago area and once again kind of went in between Iowa and um, the Illinois area. But she is the one whose brother is Ferner um, Noon, who married the Iowa writer Ruth so Sucker. Suko? Now we're all wondering, Suko, there we go. Um, but yeah, I wish I could find honestly more about her, but um, I would love to see a lot of her work. But I found her picture, actually, thanks to my sister Diane and Ancestry.com. Um, that's really about all I could find about her. But once again, a great talent. And then Daniel Rose, I learned a lot about Daniel Rose, especially through your book, Paul, um, Grant Wood and the Iowa State Fair. And he was actually from Fort Dodge. This is his painting, Stormy Weather, from 1934. And once again, I tried to somewhat pick those paintings from the 30s just to see how their styles probably um, morphed and evolved from the Stone City Art Colony. Um, he too was actually an Iowa State Fair winner. He won many times. And he ended up marrying um, Lillian Estelle Jacobs of Des Moines. She was a potter. She too was a sculptor and a figurative painter. And he met his wife, Lillian, at the Stone City Art Colony. So there's our third pair of couples from there. But he had many works that have been across many museums, many different venues. Um, but especially in not only the um, Detroit area, Des Moines area, but mainly San Francisco area where he ended up living. Um, but he was a great exhibitor at the Iowa Artist Salon from 1932 to 1939. And he too was an active artist serving as the art director for the State Recreation Division. Um, once again, another very talented Iowan. And his mentor was John Stuart Curry. All right. Paul, you'll have to keep me on point, but this is Persis. Is that how you say it? Okay. And she was a painter. She was a printmaker. Once again, attended the Stone City Art Colony. She too was a state fair winner. And this is her, um, it looks like more of a lithographed drawing called Plowing Up a Storm. Um, she too was um, her maiden name was Weaver, and I would love to do some research on that to see if she could be related to the Weavers that we know of through Grant Wood and his family. But basically, she attended both sessions of the Stone City Art Colony, and um, once again, too, Adrienne Dornbush was a mentor of hers, um, where she really, too, learned lithography, which she loved, and she ended up getting married to um, Albert Robertson, and one of their great grandchildren is a well-known actor by the name of Stephen Collins. And that's something Paul Jewell has shared with me. So it's interesting, once again, the connections, but she ended up moving out east to the Washington DC area and ended up in Bridgeport, Connecticut, where she lived until her death. But once again, too, her career took her through the Art Institute of Chicago, the Library of Congress, the Corcoran Gallery of Art, the Philadelphia Print Club. I mean, she's, she's had a lot of things exhibited and displayed in a lot of these different venues. But once again, in a lot of different circles too, in the art world with her and her husband. And uh, you can find too, an updated lithograph of hers called Front Door that is owned by the Smithsonian American Art Museum. So there she is. And these are our notable students. And I'm going to close with this. One of the reasons I love this story is that the, arts, the Stone City Art Colony, it was more than a summer school. It was more than a series of classes 
it was a community of people. And it was a community of people who came together for a moment in time. And in doing so, American art came to life. And I'll leave you with this. Who would have ever guessed it started in Iowa? Elaine, I left you one minute. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. I know it was a lot. I just didn't know what to leave out, honestly. <laughs> but all the good, all the good things, Dorothy. Just all, just all the detail. That's just a lot of people and a lot of talented people. I always thought, and I invite all of you to think of this, but it would be great to, and I know many of you have kind of started to work on this, but just all the stories coming out of the art colony, there are so many stories. And um, I hope you all continue to write about them. These are some fabulous people who've done some really incredible things. And once again, this happened in our own backyards. And luckily this group, is aware of it, but I think of just the many, many years the people of Jones and Lynn County probably don't know a lot of these stories, and I hope someday they will. Yeah, well, definitely off. You got you gave us a lot to springboard from. That's for sure. Oh my gosh, Joe, what do you got going? Well, Dorothy, uh, great presentation. Uh, Dorothy's very humble and didn't bring this up, so I'd like to ask her in the form of a question. Dorothy, could you share a little bit about your book and the tie-ins to what we just learned tonight? And you you playfully and very creatively kind of make some connections and it's wonderful fiction. Uh, could you talk about your book for us? That's very nice of you. Um, yeah, so notice the cover of my book looks a lot like Stone City. I had an artist friend in Colorado do that. He kind of did it from Stone City, but kind of gave it a different look and feel. But the the stone fruit basket, you saw that in this very first um, photo. I'll share my screen again. Let's see here. Let me go back here. But when I saw this photo of the faculty and I saw this stone fruit basket, I, I remember going up and down those steps, but the fruit baskets weren't there. In fact, the other one on the other, the pedestal on the other side was flowers. But back when I was a campfire girl in Viola, we took a hike to the ruins of the Stone City Art Colony. And I think Elaine, you might've been on that hike because um, Elaine was in Campfire Girls with me, but I'll never forget that day. You know, I'd heard about that mansion. We saw the water tower, the ice, buildings, just all of it. And it was just, there was like this forgotten opulence in a very humble area of Iowa, right? If I, you don't mind me all talking about, you know, where we all grew up, very humble groups. And to learn that there was this history there of all this greatness that came together in time was the persistence of my book. I wanted my hometown, I wanted those I grew up with to know this history and um, so my book is about a woman that comes back to write about the death of Nan Wood Graham. Now, Nan Wood Graham died on my birthday, December 14th. And so I have felt a kinship with her. And so I write about a woman coming home to write about the death of Nan Wood, only to discover all this information about the art colony. So a lot of these stories tonight I have weaved into my book, like my aunt, who um, was a painter, and she was part of the Paint and Palette Club of Anamosa. And, you know, we never paid a lot of attention to her. She used to paint on saws and all kinds of stuff, but mm -hmm. I never realized that everything I ever wanted, I'm totally, I'm totally Dorothy Gale from the Wizard of Oz. Everything I ever wanted was always in my own backyard and I didn't know it. And I always, I didn't know how cultured, um, just it's incredible, the writers, the artists, the sculptors. I mean, you think of the Iowa Writers Workshop, it's incredible, the talent in the state of Iowa. And I just thought that was a story we're sharing. So one time I went to a class at the University of Colorado. I lived in Colorado for many years. 
And I took the beginnings of the story in called Stone Fruit, which is based on the fruit basket. And I told, and the, my teacher actually, I read the excerpt said, how'd you come up with this story? And I said, well, you know, you have like Bridget the Madison County and now you have the Field of Dreams, you know, Sheila Joe Jackson comes to Iowa. And it made me want to start writing Iowa stories. And the teacher just really loved, and this is for all of you, she loved the story. Who would expect great art in the middle of depression, in the middle of rural country, in the middle of cornfields, and all this greatness is there for a moment in time? And that's what I want you all to know. You come from a very special place. The last thing I'll leave you with is when I met the Blooms, it was by accident. I went to the um, Grant Wood store. That's what it was called in Animos at the time. And I was starting, I'd been to the Metropolitan Museum and you heard in my voice, we used to think Grant Wood was like, yeah, he's, he's okay. Um, we had no idea. <laughs> and, but when I saw him in the Metropolitan Art Museum, I saw Thomas Hart Benton, I saw Hopper and I saw John Stuart Curry. And I came home going, wow, those guys did pretty good. Once again, the joke's on me. And I came back to research all of this, went to the um, Grant Wood store in Anamosa, and I just asked the question, I said, is there anybody still living that went to the Stone City art colony? And this is pre-internet, uh, so there was no information. And they said, well, there's this famous sculptress, her name is Elizabeth Bloom, and she lives in Davenport. She's well known, I never heard of her. And I said, that's funny. I said, I'm heading to Davenport to take my son to a hockey camp. So I'm heading to Davenport. I go to Isabel's store and there is a line out the block and around the block. It was phenomenal. And I said, what is it about this? And they're like, oh my gosh, this woman is incredible. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking she's from the Stone City um, art colony. It blew me away. So I walk into her store. And I say, can I talk to Isabel? I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even know I was writing a book. And they said, oh, honey, she's like 95 and she's, she's not here, but she lives somewhere around here. Well, in Isabel's shop, and I promise I'm almost done with this story, was on the wall with all her decor, but on the wall with a slate with the phone number that said 319, yada, yada, yada. And I'm like, I bet that's Isabel Bloom's phone number because only in Iowa would someone put their phone number on display on the wall. And I went out to a phone booth that states me terribly. And I called that number and a housekeeper answers and said, what is this about? And I said, I'd like to talk to Isabel. Well, what is this about? The housekeeper would not let me through until I said, it's about the Stone City Art Colony. That housekeeper put me right through and said, come tomorrow at one o'clock, you can meet the Blooms. And so Isabel, the reason they were protective, she had Parkinson's and so she was probably a year away from dying, but John was there. Uh, P2 was going through, I think some dementia. So bless their hearts, they weren't in very good shape, but they showed me their home, all of their iconic things that they collected. It was incredible afternoon. And of course they both died soon after, but. I was staying with my sister-in-law that night. She said, so what did you do today? And I said, I met Isabel Bloom. And she's like, you just don't walk up to Isabel Bloom's home in Davenport. She's like this well-known public figure. What were you thinking? I'm like, I wasn't thinking anything. But the one thing I'll leave you with tonight is something she told me. It's a theme throughout my book. Bless Isabel. She wasn't in very good health, but she kept saying, Stone City is a magical place. Stone City is a magical place. Don't forget that. I'll leave you with that. <laughs> well, thank you, Joe. <laughs> That's amazing. That's a great way to, to end. What a great quote. <laughs> There's no place like home, says Dorothy. <laughs> For sure. Well, before I forget to let everybody know that next week it's a uh, bear bathing in the moonlight with Paul. Um uh, uh unpacking Grant Wood's sultry night. And so that's going to be a treat. Let's 
yeah let's settle into that so we've got we've just got all the things all the news all the factoids all the feature presentations so this is very exciting so anybody have some thoughts to piggyback on dorothy's presentation well, just just uh dorothy it was wonderful and you know i just love the way you put it all together you're you're a very special woman but I'd like to call on Marla Dunphy because she has a little connection with those ice wagons part of the story. Marla, do you know what I'm talking about? I do. <laughs> I'm not, I know I I know I saw the articles in the I don't know the Gazette about it, but you tell because I can't remember what you're referring to. Okay. What I'm referring to is your investment advisor at Oh the John Chatama. And John. Hmm? It, was yeah. his it was his grandfather yeah my investment person at midwest bank here in iowa city um john chatham who is now passed a few years ago he was a young man actually but his grandfather all his family came from that cedar rapids area and his grandfather owned the Ch the um ice wagons the chatham that um doris mentioned and um I think, you know, it's a wonderful, they wrote it up in the Gazette. It's just a really wonderful story. And that Chatham family was um, quite an influential family. And they were, they moved out, there were Iowa City uh, family also. But was there anything else you wanted? Oh, no, that, oh, was, that was it. Oh, yeah. I wanted you to tell the story. Yeah. And I did mention one thing to Doris about, um, it's interesting, I'm from Dubuque originally, and Every year, I mean, they have, it's such an old city, the oldest in Iowa, and has a lot of remaining buildings that are old. Every year they have what's called in plain air, which is the term they have for painting outside, like Grant did with his students, where they would go out, walk around the city and take sketches or actually do some painting. They invite artists from all over the United States to come to do pictures of Dubuque, all the old buildings, the neighborhoods, different places. And they get quite a large quantity of people applying. And it's so fun that whole week you can walk around the city streets and see these people with their easels set up, painting, talk to them. And then at the end of the week, they have, uh, they invite this whole city to come one night, just special. Ex if you pay to get in, it goes to charity, but it's for auctioning off the paintings that the artist painted during the week. And, you know, sometimes your house might actually be part of the neighborhood they printed or the downtown. So, um, you know, it's wonderful what the, it's, uh, the Dubuque Art Museum, I think alive and well in Dubuque, trying to um, educate people about art and, and their own hometown. It's like, you, and you couldn't send it better. It's your own hometown and the just the beauty of things and the goodness and the people. Um, we we need to treasure them. Uh -huh. It's just like you do a viola. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think that's a it's a great thing to you know to say in general. We can be proud of Grant Wood. He is an Iowa boy. And for those of us who have Iowa roots, we're proud of him. Very much. And in fact, I always tell my closest friends when I wrote that book, um, every night I got to go home in my mind. Well, I have to say that the uh, Octagon House that you were talking about is also an Underground Railroad stop. <laughs> that's right. They tore it down, but that's what I understand. Now, now you've got me intrigued because the Octagon House was... I'm working on a history for Viola and Brown Township. The Octagon House was owned by um, one of the our classmates' grandparents, uh, Pat Bingham. Diane will recognize that name. Uh, her grandfather was a blacksmith in Viola, and that was on the paternal side, but her maternal grandmother uh, lived, I think, and built the Octagon House. So we need to chat, Steve. <laughs> oh, include oh. me. <laughs> so, so Linda, have you talked to my aunt Barb? Because that Pat Bingham's her mother. We had a wonderful visit with uh, she and Clayton at the picnic this summer. 
Great. So, and if anybody has any materials that they come across specific to Viola, um, please share what you can. I would love it. I saw that in a booklet on Viola. For, I don't remember where, but I remember that only because I went looking for that house. Of course, it's not there anymore. No, it's not there. No. No. But I, I have I have some fairly decent pictures of it that Pat shared with me. So yeah. I would love to see the photos, Linda, sometime. Certainly. Yeah, that that Working would be on fun. <laughs> and you know that picture of Grant and the students and Marvin Cohen and Adrian with the students there in Bilo, I don't think I would ever know that was Biola. Um, without that octagon house, that was a that was a gift that they mm -hmm. got that in that photo. Yeah, if if you're able, I would love to have copies of those two photos. Yes, I'll make a quick note. And just a small thing that I came across when I discovered one of my cousins had passed in November, so I went through the Anamosa Eureka looking for him and found him in the sixth grade in Morley. And he was sharing with his classmates two letters that his grandmother had received from Grant Wood. They had attended Antioch school together. Now I have to figure out where those letters are and mm -hmm. I have no place to start from because all those cousins are dead now. Lots of thoughts came to my mind, Dorothy, as you were talking, but one of the artists you mentioned, Daniel Rhodes, and if you uh, live anywhere near Marion and go to the Marion Historical Society, they have his mural that he painted for the post office in Marion, uh, in the Marion uh, Historical Society building. It's worth seeing. It's nicely done. I was thrilled to see that his was in Marion, but I knew that that, yeah, it wasn't probably in existence or not the post office, but it is. They, they saved it. Wow. And also uh, Dennis Burling, Burlingame, um, he roomed in New York City with Jackson Pollock, uh, who was responsible for the big mural at the Stanley now too. Um, just the little oh. different things. I come to mind all the time as you talk. That's awesome. Paul, I'm so grateful for your books. Um, you know, it was funny, about 10 years ago, I went to the Animals of the Library and there was a gentleman talking about Grant Wood. My mom and I went and thought, this will be kind of fun. It ended up being Paul. Um, <laughs> of course, we didn't get to, you know, really meet and talk again for another 10 years. Well, then I moved to California and Debbie, I'm trying to remember how we met. Um, all of a sudden, Iowa I'm, thing, wasn't it? Or what was it, was Diane? The Iowa uh, thing on the ship. We we did meet oh. in person on the USS Iowa. In that's you know it's like we did meet there in person, but I don't know it. I think maybe through Facebook originally. It was, it was your site. And I reached out to Debbie because I had seen Nan's house in Riverside. And then I saw, that's right, I saw your Facebook site. And to talk to some kind of the California side of the family was just, that was godsend too, because, um, you know, we always wondered, you know, Nan always came back to Anamosa and was in the parade. We knew she lived in California, but we didn't know a lot about her California roots, you know, um, so that when you came into the picture, um, you just put so many puzzle pieces into the greater puzzle of all of this. And um, that was and really of, cool. Of course, Frank and Clara came out in 1960 to San Diego to live with um, Clara's widowed sister, who was my grandmother. So, and because of Frank and Clara moving out, we got to meet Nan. I met Nan and Ed when I was three years old. And I think I've shared, you know, the the home movies of Christmas Eve with Nan and Ed and, and Frank and Clara. So, but we also 
didn't we meet at a restaurant one time and I brought my shoe box of things that Nan had given me from her trips to to Iowa, the little uh, woman with plants doll and a wooden nickel that she'd gotten me from there. So if Debbie oh, opens up a shoe box that has Grant Wood days written all over it. And of course to her, it's just Nan brought something back from a trip to Iowa. And I'm going, oh my gosh, this is from 1973 Grant Wood, you know, days. Um, and I recognize the doll. I recognize the whole vibe around it. Um, that was really cool. That was just like someone opening up like a time capsule, really. And we also have had, when I lived with my parents, a picture of Stone City on the on the wall. So I don't know how many Californians had Stone City, but we did <laughs> right near our parakeets. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Having birds and parakeets was a thing back in the day, wasn't it? We had our family was always into birds. We had an aviary in our backyard with finches and of course this California weather is a little more doesn't have as extremes as as Iowa for sure. And um but yeah, we had cage parakeets in the house and I have a picture of them and in the back you can see the picture of Stone City. So I, hopefully they enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> and Nan was a great lover of parakeets, by the way, of stories of she would, I would make her repeat stories of her, her parakeets. But again, I can go on and on, but that's, she loved birds too. Oh my goodness. Well, so so to Dorothy's point, just so many rabbit holes to continue to to go down. So we there's no end in sight to this thing. But next week we gotta we gotta delve into bathing in the in the moonlight, bear bathing in the moonlight. So there you go. Paul, do you what? want us to be there in person? What's that? Do you want us to be there in person? Um, well, I hope so. I'd like, I'd like that. I'd like you to be sitting right here, but <laughs> California is a long way away. Uh, oh, I you like the program uh, next week. Um, it, uh, I'm going to be revealing who I think, uh, the model was for a sultry night and who some other people think was a model also, but there's some connections with, uh, him and other people that I think you'll enjoy. Great. I know I promised to do it in the nude, but I don't think I will. It's, <laughs> it's, winter, it's winter here in Iowa, and I just don't think it would be the best. That's Thanks, why I was teasing Paul. you if you wanted us in person, yeah. but. <laughs> yeah. no, I, didn't, I didn't put all that together. <laughs> we mammals still need our fur, don't we? Now you can put on the Zoom nude, that would be fine. It, it's, you know, it's comfortable. <laughs> we can all yeah. come like that next week, huh? <laughs> that was your suggestion, Dorothy, not mine. <laughs> you never know what to expect with these artist types, I, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness well i dare say it looks like all great things must eventually come to an end um where and so i would expect that this will be on available on the youtube you know not too distant future so we can roll around in it as much as we need to so that's the good news too compliments of Dorothy. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine, and, for organizing it all. Oh, sure. Very sweet. Yeah. Really so, enjoyed it. Great. Well, if, so I think we best, we best bid adieu.